The Institute for Health and Healing is a comprehensive integrative medicine program at Sutter Health, dedicated to healing people and transforming healthcare. Check us out at myhealthandhealing.org or on Facebook. Now I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker for the evening, Sarah Gottfried. Um, Dr. Gottfried is a, a graduate of Harvard Medical School and MIT. She completed her residency at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, and she's the founder and chief medical officer of the Gottfried Institute, whose mission it is to advance health span wellness. I think she's going to tell us about health span wellness via science backed functional medicine supplements, shakes, and online courses. Uh, it's under the brand Reset 360. And over the past three decade, decades, Dr. Gottfried has seen more than 25,000 patients. Boy, you've been busy. Whew. She believes in treating the root cause of the problem, not the symptoms. And depending upon the individual, she might pres prescribe supplements to fill nutritional gaps, an iPhone app that helps you connect to your heart, botanical therapies or bioidentical hormones, and her mission uh, the Gottfried, her mission at the Gottfried Institute and in life is to help women feel sexy, vital, and balanced from their cells to their soul. That means getting your weight right where you want it, getting your energy and sex drive maximized, and doing it naturally and safe, safely. She's a three-time New York Times best-selling author. She's a global keynote speaker. And her best-selling books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and her latest, Younger, A Breakthrough Program to Reset Your Genes, Reverse Aging, and Turn Back the Clock 10 Years. With that, I am really happy to introduce Dr. Gottfried, who will help us turn back the clock 10 years. San Francisco, I am so excited to be with you today. I, I love that I can talk about randomized controlled trials, estrogen dominance, and rolfing within the same sentence to my audience in San Francisco. And you guys get it. You totally get it. That's not always true around the world. So thank you, Dr. Tony Brer. So, Grateful for your introduction and for your leadership. Jennifer Tolson, thank you for your introduction. And Jennifer Griffin, fantastic job with your case, which, how many of you felt like she was talking about you? <laughs> yes? Oh my gosh. So I first gave a talk at Mini Medical School 19 years ago. And uh, Barb Silver was in charge of it then. And I organized my thinking about women and hormones and perimenopause. I, I gave cases very similar to what uh, Dr. Griffin just described. And I, I just want to honor Mini Medical School because it was so influential for me in terms of my thinking about the female body. Now, I think a lot about the male body now, too. But at the time, I was focused on women. I was board certified in everything that can go wrong with the female body. That was within kind of the conventional medicine construct. And now I'm much more focused on everything that can go right with the female body and how do we leverage those positive aspects and bring them to bear on the things that we need to improve. And I see a lot of men in the audience too. And so I just want to tell you, it's not all about the chicks tonight. We've got a lot of content for you as well. Elizabeth Blackburn. So I moved to San Francisco from Boston in 1994. And in 2004, Elizabeth Blackburn published a landmark study. She looked at women who had a sick child, women who had a child in the intensive care unit at UCSF. And she compared them 
to women who had healthy children. Those were the controls. She expected that the women with a sick kid would be aging faster. She measured their telomeres, those little caps on chromosomes that are a marker of your biological aging as opposed to your chronological aging. And she was surprised by the results because she found that it didn't matter if your kid was sick. What mattered was your perceived stress. It's true that the number of years that you spent taking care of a chronically ill child did affect your telomere length and therefore how fast you were aging. But this issue of perceived stress really got my attention. So this was 2004. And what she found was that the women who had high perceived stress were aging 10 years faster than the women who had a normal amount of perceived stress. And when I read this study, I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> who are those people who have a normal amount of perceived stress? Because I don't know them. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I need to pay attention to this because I feel like this is something that I'm not managing well. And I wonder if my patients are also having a difficult time with this. So in 2009, she got the Nobel Prize. There aren't enough women that have gotten the Nobel Prize. You know she had to work about 10 times harder than any man who's gotten the Nobel Prize, so hooray for her. And when she got the Nobel Prize, I decided I want to test myself. Like, before I start testing patients, I want to see how I'm doing. At the time, I had my hormones in a pretty good place. I had worked on my cortisol. I was taking Chase Berry. My progesterone was where it should be. My estrogen dominance was a thing of the past. My thyroid was, you know, A+. Plus. So I, I saunter into the lab. Not quite smug, but feeling kind of good about how virtuous I am. And I get the result back. And at age 45, I had the telomeres of a 65-year-old woman. So I was aging 20 years faster than I should be. So this got my attention. This is what led to my latest book. And when I get a result like that, I'm trained to be a skeptic. So, I, of course, I repeated the test. You always want at least two points on a line. So I repeated it and got the same damn result. <laughs> so I had a problem that I was facing. And so I, I dived into the literature that we have on the aging process. And what I want to share with you tonight, in the 30 minutes that we have to go through five of the most important genes, I want to share with you why? I want to start with why. I think that's a really important place to begin. I want to talk about some of the terms like health span, inflammation, and also three strategies that really move the needle for me when it comes to the aging process. Some of them were alluded to by Dr. Griffin, and we're going to chunk it down. We're going to get into the details. So I want to ask you about your why. Why do you care about aging? And I want you to think about that as we begin, because we all have a different why. I want to see how my kids turn out. I want to have great sex with my husband for as long as possible. I want to be like my great-grandmother, who died in her sleep at 97, still practicing yoga, eating whole foods, still able to put her foot behind her head in a pretzel yoga pose. So she's my model. She's my model of wholeness. For my husband, he wants to eat as many lemon ricotta pancakes as possible. He's a big fan, not necessarily gluten-free. He's one of my favorite patients and also one of my worst patients because he follows about 10% of the directions I give him. They're still impactful, but uh, 
I try to do better with my patients. He's also a fly fisherman. So there's one river in particular in Northern California where he stands in that river anytime between about April and September and he feels at home. He feels grounded. He feels like himself. He feels like he can hear that teeny little voice inside. He feels that sense of like spiritual home. Great sex. This is something I heard from a lot of my friends. I was excited to hear that. So I want to ask you about your why. Think about your why. Why do you care? I also have a grandmother on my other side who had Alzheimer's disease. And she languished in a nursing home for 18 years before she died, unable to recognize any of us. And she was also my primary caretaker as I was growing up. My mother worked full time. So I was very close to her. But starting when I was about six, seven years old, she would get lost driving home from the grocery store. So she started to have these early signs in her 60s of Alzheimer's disease. And I don't want that to happen to me or to you. So this slide is super complicated. But I want to highlight the five genes we're going to talk about. This makes me laugh a little bit because I'm in a mastermind with a group of other clinicians. And when I was writing this book younger, I told them, guys, I've got it narrowed down to 25 genes. I'm so excited. Like, I thought that was such a huge achievement. And they were like, uh, Sarah, seven. <laughs> Seven max, like no one can think about more than seven. So this is my compromise slide, kind of in between the two. Seven is what I focus on in the book. But here's some of the slides that I, th the genes that I think are the most important. There's three longevity genes. One is FOXO3. Another is CERT1. And then a third is mTOR. So we're gonna be talking about those three genes and how to regulate them with lifestyle medicine. We're also going to talk about the FATSO gene. That's the affectionate name. It's also known as FTO. It is the gene that is the most highly correlated with weight. So it tracks with body mass index. It's one of the most important predictors of obesity and also diabetes. It gives you sloppy control of leptin. Leptin is the hormone of satiety. So if you have a problem with leptin, you tend to not feel sated with food. Another gene that we're going to talk about is the clock gene. And this gene is super important. And by the way, I have a problem with all of these genes. <laughs> How many of you have done genetic testing? OK, so a few of you. When you do genetic testing, pretty much all of us have three to five rather scary genes that we want to modulate. I haven't seen anyone who kind of escapes that rule. And the good news is your genes are not your destiny. So when it comes to most chronic disease, about 10% of your risk of disease is genetic. 90% is your environment, much of which is under your control. 90%. There's some diseases like addiction that don't quite fit into the 90-10 rule. They're more like 50-50. But when, it, when we talk about the biggies, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, it's about 90-10. One of the reasons why we're talking about genetic testing is because of the dramatic reduction in the cost of genome testing. So I was at MIT when the Human Genome Project started way over here in 1990. 
at the White Whitehead Institute as well as institutes around the country. The first genome was published in 2003 and the cost was $2.7 billion. Fortunately, the price has come down quite a bit since then. So now, this slide only goes to 2015, but now it costs around $1,200 to get your genome tested. And of course, you can do genetic testing. You may want to ask about this during our Q&A. If you're curious about genetic testing, it's not something that you need to do to benefit from the book because there are certain rules that help all of us. But if you're curious about it, we can talk about some of the different labs that do genetic testing. And that's a quick reminder to me to tell you that I don't have any conflicts of interest. I think that's important as a speaker to share that. I don't work with any supplement manufacturers. I don't work with any of these labs that do genetic testing. I don't have any conflicts of interest. So for the geeks in the audience, the cost of genome testing has reduced much faster than Moore's law. Important to know. So let's talk about inflammation. Dr. Griffin talked quite a bit about inflammation, how inflammation can be normal. It's meant to last for about three days. And the problem in terms of aging is when it lasts much longer than that. So excess inflammation, that's chronic. And what happens with inflammation, which is kind of a hybrid term, kind of the worst of both, is that you have a lot of wear and tear. The Western diet is associated with inflammation. Insulin resistance is probably one of the most important factors. And insulin resistance is something we're going to talk about a fair amount tonight. I know it's one of those terms that kind of makes your eyes glaze over, but I want to make it come alive tonight because probably 35% of you have insulin resistance, which you may or may not know. I didn't know it. When I was 35 and I went to the lab after my doctor offered me an antidepressant, a birth control pill, and told me to exercise more and eat less, I tested my fasting glucose my fasting insulin, my cortisol, and my progesterone. My fasting glucose was about 113, so I was pre-diabetic. My fasting insulin was in the 20s, also suggestive of insulin resistance. It's not the gold standard. The gold standard is an insulin clamp. I didn't have that available when I was working at the time. My cortisol, the main stress hormone was three times what it should have been. I was basically a cortisol junkie. And just as Dr. Griffin described so beautifully, I had pregnenolone steel. So that mother hormone of all the other hormones in my body was just making cortisol, 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 24-7. And I had to get out of that pattern. So you can measure inflammation we use high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. Interleukin-6 is one of the best markers. And a lot of the longevity studies that are being done around the world are finding that these are some of the best markers of how fast you're aging, in addition to telomeres. Hand grip strength is another one that's very important. Homocysteine is another measure of inflammation. Another issue is lack of microbiome diversity. We're not talking a lot about that tonight. We only have 30 minutes. So I'm going to skip ahead to a question I got. When, I, when I'm writing a book, I often will give a talk about the content. And it's so helpful to me because I can tell from the questions like where I need to go deeper. So I'm going to be looking for that in your questions tonight. Don't, let, don't find that daunting. You know, ask me whatever you want. Um, but I, I had someone ask me when I first started talking about the aging process. I had someone say, inflammation? How do I know if I have it? Yes, I can do these blood tests. I can look at IL-6 and homocysteine, and frankly, very few people do interleukin-6. How do I know? And 
one of the ways you know is kind of a level of stiffness, fatigue, brain fog. Those are signs of inflammation, signs of inflammation. They're nonspecific, though. Another one is feeling what David Brooks at the New York Times calls hippocampically challenged. Another word for that is um, CRS. I'm in a synagogue, so I feel like I can't swear, but do people know what that means? Yes, okay. I'm in San Francisco, you know what that means. No, okay. Anyone wanna shout it out? <laughs> there you go. I'm a nice Jewish girl, I don't wanna swear up here. Okay. Another way to know that you have inflammation is puffiness, like when you look in the mirror. And I used to have this, if I had, if I was like our case Linda, and I had a couple of glasses of wine, especially if it wasn't organic, and if I binge watched TV and went to bed a little too late, the next day my, my face would be quite puffy. And I can see it in my face when I have inflammation. And I'm gonna take a risk here and give a quick example. Have any of you heard of the Kardashians? <laughs> so, if I happen to see a photo of the Kardashians, they look inflamed to me. They look puffy. I know some of it is plastic surgery and maybe intended, but they look inflamed. On the other hand, if I look at Jennifer Aniston, she is a serious yoga practitioner. She's got organic chickens in her backyard. She eats avocado every day. She has an anti-inflammatory diet, the way that Dr. Griffin described. She does not look inflamed to me. She does not have this level of puffiness. So with apologies to the Kardashians. Courtney Kardashian, on the other hand, does eat a little better. Not always. She's a little less inflamed. So let's talk about lifespan. Another term is health span. And I want to talk about the difference between lifespan and health span. So lifespan is the period of time that you live. And on average in the US, the aging process tends to begin around age 30. A lot of people don't realize that. So, neuroinflammation, the type that leads to Alzheimer's disease, begins decades before symptoms. So for my grandmother, that began in her 30s. And so the time to do something about it is as early as possible. It's never too early and it's also never too late. Chronic disease has an average onset in the US of 63. And the average death in the US is age 79. So the idea with health span is that instead of having a spectrum like this, you want to prevent as much aging as possible. You want to avoid chronic disease. So you want to avoid disease span, and you want to take that period of time where you feel fantastic and in the prime of your life and lengthen it as long as possible. So that's what I mean by health span. It's like what my great-grandmother had. If you want a measure of your own health span, I poured over about 2,500 studies to do a free calculation. So you can see that at healthspans.com. You can also do some functional medicine testing. So the first breakthrough strategy is called a box jump. How many of you are fans of the box jump? All right. I love it because the hands go up really high and like strong when I ask that question. There's usually like three. <laughs> so
so I was at a spa in Southern California when I was writing this book. And I went to a high intensity interval training class. And I'm kind of a yoga girl. I really love yoga and Pilates. I was so much like Linda that I needed adaptive exercise to kind of get out of the hole that I was in, especially with my adrenal function and my thyroid function and my estrogen dominance. So I did a lot of yoga and Pilates. And because I'm a type A personality, although now I would say I'm a type A minus, like I'm getting a little bit better, I became a yoga teacher, of course. So I'm in this high intensity interval training class with my husband, who's very competitive. And the instructor, who's about 26 and gorgeous, says to us, okay, we're gonna do the jump box. So he puts these boxes in front of us, there's about 10 of us, and he puts this 18 inch box in front of me. And I'm looking at the box and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> and so he demonstrates. He takes a 36 inch box and he goes from, you know, both feet on the ground, he jumps up on the 36 inch box. Very, with so much agility. And then he jumps off and he says, now you. So I'm looking at this 18 inch box and I summoned my gymnast from my teenage years. And I didn't look at my husband because he was already, like he did 20 at this point. <laughs> and I jumped up on this 18 inch box and I was so happy that I didn't wipe out. I was so happy that I didn't embarrass myself. And then I jumped back down as gracefully as possible and then he says, 12 more. <laughs> and what I realized in that moment is that I was starting to lose certain muscle fibers. So when I went through biology, there were only like three muscle fibers. There was the type one, which is endurance sports, right? Like the marathon runners have a lot of type one muscle fibers. There was the type 2A, which is kind of in between the endurance and the sprinter type of muscle fiber, which at that time was 2B. Now it's called 2X. There's a total of about six different muscle fibers now. There's more being named all the time. But what I learned is that as you age, you lose the type 2B, now known as 2X, the super fast twitch muscle fibers first. So it's not like all your muscles start to waste equally. You lose the fast ones first. So one of the important things to do to slow down the aging process is to work on your 2B or 2X muscle fibers. So you can do a box jump, you can also swing a kettlebell. You can sprint. That's what my husband likes to do. He likes to sprint up mountains on his bike. You can also do plyometric push-ups, something my sister is fond of. That person who raised their hand in the back, you probably have a few other strategies for 2B muscle fibers. But you, you want to pick what you will do consistently. And I want to share with you what I do consistently because I did buy a box after I got back from the spa and it's used as kind of an end table <laughs> in my family room, I'm afraid to say. Does anyone know what this is? Peloton, oh my gosh, yes. Are there any Peloton addicts in the room? So I am a Peloton addict. So the Peloton is considered one of the best innovations in home gym equipment anytime in the past 10 to 20 years. It is a stationary bike that has a touch screen and it allows you to be piped into a live class that's happening in New York and compete on a leaderboard. <laughs> And I cannot believe 
how much fun I am having with this particular machine. It's like I'm having a love affair. So it's a little pricey, but I can tell you it's really helping me with my muscle fibers because I am consistent about it. So I do it six days a week. I do different types. Some days I do high intensity interval training. Some days I do low impact training, which is more about kind of the pedal stroke and getting it really smooth. My favorite instructor is Robin Orzon. I also like Matt Wilpers. I just did a, a six week challenge that he offered and improved my FTP by 23%. So some of you may know what that means. I improved my performance, my power performance by 23% over six weeks. And for someone who is 50 years old and really can't stand to exercise, that's a big deal. So that's how I work on my muscle fibers. The next strategy is intermittent fasting. How many of you do intermittent fasting? Oh, good. Okay, we've got more takers here. So intermittent fasting is really interesting because it is common knowledge but I find that a lot of people don't quite do it right. They don't quite see the results they want to see. So it's worth talking about and also going through some of the data. For those of us who have adrenal and thyroid issues, HBA, TG, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, gonadal, axis dysfunction, you have to be careful with intermittent fasting. Because sometimes you can have issues with hypoglycemia, where you just have a fight with your husband every time you try intermittent fasting. So we have to be careful about how we do it. There's a number of different protocols. The one I'm doing right now is called 16-8. What that means is I have an eating window that's eight hours. So I had breakfast today at 11 a.m. I finished eating by 7 p.m. And then I have an overnight fast until 11 tomorrow. So eight hours of eating, 16 hours of fasting. Some people don't do well with that for women who have adrenal and thyroid issues and for men as well. Sometimes uh, more of a crescendo approach is better. I do intermittent fasting 16-8 seven days a week. What we know is that one day a week of intermittent fasting slows down the aging process. One day a week. And that's a good place to start, especially if you have hormone issues. Two days a week is what's been shown to make a difference with weight loss. I did not have weight loss at two days a week. So I stuck with it. I did a crescendo process where I did it two days a week, not consecutive. I did Pilates and yoga on those days, not high intensity interval training. And I built up to doing it every day. So about every two weeks, I would add another day. So you can ask us in the Q&A session if you wanna get into more details about that. So what does intermittent fasting do? It resets insulin. It gives you mental acuity. It reverses fatty liver. And just as I described, 35% of you probably have insulin resistance. Somewhere around 25 to 30% of you have fatty liver and may or may not know it. What else does it do? It increases myelin. That becomes more important as you get older, especially if you have CRS. And it turns white fat beige. Thermogenesis, we want more of that as we get older. It provides weight loss and it turns on CERT1, one of those longevity genes. When you exercise after an intermittent fast, so this morning I did a 90 minute Peloton ride, an endurance ride, and I did it fasted. So that helps to regulate the mTOR gene. mTOR is one of those genes that gets overactive so you actually want to shut it down. 
So the other unfortunate news here is that starting in your 40s, your blood sugar goes up by 10 points per decade. 10 points, that's a lot. Here I was having a problem in my 30s with my blood sugar. And it was only gonna become more of a problem as I got older. I have about seven genes that dysregulate my blood sugar. So unless you're doing something about this, it may be causing inflammation in your body. When you improve glucose metabolism, it actually helps you avoid 60% of cognitive decline. 60%. That is such a needle mover. Huge. One thing. So I'm going to skip over some of these slides so that we can get to your questions. Here are some of the strategies that help you with insulin resistance. I sometimes call it insulin block because very few people can remember what insulin resistance actually is. It's when your cells become numb to insulin. But resistance on a receptor level is not always intuitive for people. So how do you avoid it? Eating a maximal amount of healthy carbs and also a minimal amount of protein. So getting this ratio correct. So for me, when I eat too much protein, I went paleo about 10 years ago. And I was, I was kind of excited to be eating so much meat. But my blood sugar rose. And what I discovered was that I was eating too much protein. And I needed to limit the amount of protein I was having at each meal to about three ounces. That was my sweet spot. We all have a different sweet spot. Eating more fiber, that's one of the best ways to regulate your blood sugar. Organic plant-based food makes a big difference. Test your blood sugar regularly. Most conventional physicians are gonna test your fasting blood sugar. You want your level to be between 70 and 85 milligrams per deciliter. Above that, there's a greater chance of insulin resistance. And intermittently fast. You want to make your muscles hungry for glucose. One of the best ways to do that, if you learn nothing else today, I want you to take this away. When you use all of these different muscle fibers, so the endurance muscle fibers type 1, the type 2B or 2X that are the fast twitch, like from high velocity exercise, and then the type 2A that are intermediate between the two. When you use all three types of muscle fibers, that makes your body more hungry for glucose. So it helps to lower your blood sugar. Mindfulness lowers fasting blood sugar. Apple cider vinegar, berberine, especially when it's combined with milk thistle, the two together increase the efficacy, and chromium. So these are some of the interventions that are proven with randomized trials. So I want to wrap up here with what steals your youth. Starting around 35, you gain fat and you lose muscle. For me, it was from sitting too much. At the time, in my 30s, I was seeing about 40 patients a day. I was sitting way too much. Then I'd sit in my car and commute home. And then I wrote a book, and I sat even more. <laughs> I gained about 30 pounds. It wasn't pretty. There was like this inflammatory frat party happening in my body that I needed to turn around. Taking certain medications, including antihistamines, anti-anxiety pills, this has been shown to be associated with a greater risk of dementia. My husband used to take Tylenol PM every night. And then I told him, honey, Benadryl, antihistamines, can make you at a greater risk of dementia. And his response was, what? <laughs> <laughs> he loves to joke. Eating too many carbs, losing sleep, running low in vitamin D. What's the optimal amount of sleep? 
10 for you. 7 to 8.5 hours is what's been proven to be the most effective. I always have patients who come to see me and they say, oh, no, 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 I only need about six hours. 3% of the population does well with less than seven hours. 3%. So the 97% of the rest of us need at least seven to 8.5 hours. Perceiving high stress, going back to Elizabeth Blackburn, isolating socially, lacking vision and purpose. So I am gonna finish here, and we actually have our Q&A next, and then we have the book signing afterwards. So I wanna thank you for your attention. And also, before we ask questions, you can stand up if you want. <laughs> and move your muscles around. And <laughs> Thank you.